Well, good evening, everybody. I hope that you are not missing too much football this evening. And a very big and warm welcome to the second Clinica London Retinal Masterclass. Tonight, we're going to hear Miss Evgenia Anikina. Thank you very much. Over to you, Jen. Thank you very much, Jane, for that kind introduction. Um, and welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some ripping retinas today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, here we go. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Sam, tell me if uh, you yeah. can't see that. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so as Jane mentioned, um, I'm a consultant ophthalmologist. I'm, I'm working in uh, Windsor and Reading, which is the Royal Berkshire NHS Trust, and I do my private practice over in Clinica in London. So, ripping retinas, pearls, and pitfalls. Um, uh, you may submit questions uh, at any time through the Q&A, and we'll address them in a couple of the breaks throughout the presentation. Um, so, uh, what are we going to cover today? First of all, uh, I want to do a brief overview of the anatomy because there's going to be a wide variety of people joining and I want to, us all to be on the same page. I'm going to think about the warning symptoms and the urgency of review for anyone presenting uh, with a retinal detachment type symptom. Key points in examining them. Uh, retinal tears, uh, what we want to treat and how quickly we want to do it uh, and what we can safely leave. Um, a quick... Um, a recap of how we do the laser for the retinal tears and then moving on to the retinal detachment section um, types and causes of detachments risk factors um, i'm going to show you a surgical video i'm not sure many of you have seen surgery but um, it's probably helpful to see um, what happens um, a note on aftercare and then a quick um, side about a detachment not being a detachment um, so what is a retinal detachment a bit of anatomy here on the left, we've got a lovely uh, pathology specimen of the vitreous. And this is just to remind me to tell you that the vitreous is not just watery jelly. It's a structure. It's got lots of protein strands in it. Um, it's got a scaffold. Um, and that is the main problem with it. Um, and the retina is made up of many layers. Um, and this becomes relevant later on in the talk when I'm going to talk about the relevance of these. Of course, underlying everything is this retinal pigment epithelial layer, the pigmented layer, and then above that is the neurosensory retina with all the uh, cells that are picking up the light and transmitting the messages. So vitreous is not just a watery jelly. Um, the proteins inside uh, contribute to some firm adhesions between the retina um, and the jelly. It's useful before we're born, it helps the eye to form and it degenerates throughout life afterwards. And you get this posterior vitreous detachment, which you will all be familiar with, uh, with this lovely vice ring that you see um, uh, floating above the optic nerve. Um, so here we come to our first question. So I'm going to go, so where is the vitreous attached most firmly? At the disc, at the macula? around the retinal blood vessels or at the aura serrata. And I'm just going to go to polling now. Uh, you should all have the live polling up on your screens. Feel free to vote. Tell me what you think. All will be revealed. So, going well, going well, going, going, going. Let's wait for a few more lagging behind on the votes don't think too much all will be revealed we're at 68 percent of votes there's a few i'm gonna give you one few more seconds a few more seconds right i'm gonna end that now and collect that now so we've got at the aura serrata is the winning vote and at the disc is the second. And I can see why people said that. Now, at the aura serrata was indeed correct. Uh, because of course, there we go. At the aura serrata, of course, um, 
is uh, where the vitreous never detaches, it's where it remains attached all the time. And here we've got lines of tension through the vitreous, and you can see that it firmly attaches here at the vitreous base, which is located at the orocerata. At the disc is a reasonably firm attachment, which is what comes off as the vice ring, um, and around the blood vessels and at the macula are the other attachments. So hence the vice ring from where it comes off around the disc during a PVD, at the macula, hence you get vitreomacular traction from persistent traction. At the retinal blood vessels, hence you can bleed when you sustain a posterior vitreous detachment. And at the orocerata, hence you get peripheral retinal tears because you can't separate the vitreous and the retina here. Um, these are some OCTs of the posterior hyaloid membrane, which is the back surface of the vitreous. Um, and you can see where it's attached around the blood vessels here and you can see it coming off the macula successfully. So, um, a PVD happens in everyone, commonly in the, between the 50s and the 70s. However, trauma, inflammation, genetics, a number of things can make it happen earlier. It tends to happen a bit early in myopes as well. You get this gradual liqu liquefaction of the vitreous, it turning more watery instead of more jelly-like and the collagen fibers stick together forming empty spaces and vacuoles inside the vitreous and you get this sudden collapse now i've put sudden in inverted commas because this um can happen between hours to weeks um, and this is the reason that with pvd symptoms we as ophthalmologists like to review patients a couple of weeks after the onset of symptoms so initially and a couple of weeks after, because in some people it can go on for several weeks and you can continue to develop retinal tears. So, our next poll. What symptoms can indicate a retinal tear or detachment? Increase in floaters or new floaters, flashing lights, shadow in the vision, blurred vision, none of the above or all of the above. So I'm just going to relaunch the poll for that question. Feel free to press your buttons. And I'm glad that all of the above is winning. It is winning rather decisively there. And that's excellent news. Well done. I'm going to stop it there. And that won very decisively. Um, so, all of the above, um, whereas all of these symptoms can also indicate absolutely nothing and just be a plain vanilla PVD, um, the, they can all indicate problems. Um, patient symptoms are not predictive, oh sorry, that's supposed to be PVD versus retinal tear versus retinal detachment. So. Uh, you can't say someone's having flashes, someone's having, um, well, that means they're having a detachment, someone's having blurred vision, that means they're having a retinal tear. So any of the symptoms can mean nothing, a tear or a detachment. And examination can give us clues on this. Just uh, as a caveat, if you're ever in doubt, do refer and do refer urgently because we never mind checking these patients. Um, this is one of the things we completely don't mind getting referrals for because I think it's completely justified. Um, urgently, if the symptoms are fairly recent, if they've had floaters for six months and they haven't changed, we can see them routinely. So, a word on floaters. What are floaters? Well, they're collagen fibers. Um, you also get the vice ring. Some people appreciate that as a floater. You get asteroid hyalosis, people see that, although usually people aren't very symptomatic of asteroid. Um, if you get a retinal tear, you get release of the pigment from the RPE layer, which can people see as the shower of uh, little black dots. Hemorrhage, of course, will give you floaters. Um, inflammation and vitritis can present just with floaters and no other symptoms. Foreign bodies and also entoptic phenomena. Now, I've got another mini quiz, which is not gonna come up as a quiz, but I'm just going to um, ask you in your own heads um, to match the pictures to the floaters. So one, uh, collagen fibers, which one of the pictures is that? Two, asteroid hyalosis, which one's that? Three, RP pigment release and tobacco dust, inflammatory cells and intoptic phenomena. 
just match that quickly in your heads and we'll see if uh, if you're right in a second i won't make people vote for this one so Collagen fibers, that's number A. So those classic little strings, that's those um, protein fibers that start to stick together um, as everyone ages. Asteroid hyalosis number C, so with these glowing beautiful specks like a snow globe that we see on the slit lamp. These are often asymptomatic. Um, tobacco dust, there's a lovely picture by my colleague Aman Chandra from South End um, of beautiful tobacco dust there in the anterior vitreous. Where I'm coming from a uh, retinal tear. Uh, inflammatory cells of vitritis, that will be B, those tiny fine ones. So they look a lot smaller than uh, the tobacco dust or the um, uh, asteroid hyalosis. And the entoptic phenomena has to be E. So I found this great graphic with the, uh, unfortunately, the shutterstock image on it. Um, but these little tiny uh, glowing dots, which are actually the white blood cells inside the capillaries of your retina that you see when you look at a backlit background or a bright blue sky. So my floater looks like a worm. That's just a little aside uh, to keep everyone awake. Uh, sometimes uh, a floater that looks like a worm is a worm, uh, which is what these pictures show. Uh, and it's incredibly rare, of course, especially in this country. Uh, but every once in a while, we come across some of these. Do we treat floaters? Well, sometimes. Um, if there's no, first of all, we need to check for any serious uh, problems such as detachment or tears. Um, but sometimes even the floaters themselves are enough of a problem. And if the patient reports disabling system symptoms that significantly affects their quality of life, uh, if they say, you know, I'm struggling to drive, I'm struggling to see through this cloud, we can consider it. It's always caution with any inflammatory causes because you can make that worse with surgery. Um, as I mentioned, asteroid is rarely symptomatic, so you really want to make sure that they're genuinely having a, a, a significant problem from their asteroid. And I would always delay surgery after an acute, sort of sudden increase in floaters such as a PVD. I wouldn't wade straight in. I would give them a few months for it to settle because most of them do. However, if they're still having problems um, after that time, then by all means, we can discuss surgery. Now, some of you may have heard of a YAG laser floaterectomy, which is where you take a YAG laser and you hunt the floaters um, around the eye, trying to zap them into little bits. Um, it's easily enough done. I'm not uh, a great proponent of it, simply because you tend to take one big floater and make lots of small ones. Um, and in my experience, the patient satisfaction is not quite so good with it. So I'm prepared to offer it if the patient's very keen on it. Um, but I think a vitrectomy is sort of a more definitive uh, management. So a little word on flashes. We're approaching our first break, but I just wanted to cover this. Um, so a vitreous detachment related flash or photopsia is typically described as an arc or a crescent in the temporal visual field. It is brief, the light is white or yellowish, more obvious in the dark, and it happens in one eye. Sometimes patients are not clear on the last one there. If they're talking about colored flashes, if the flash is moving across their vision, and if it takes a few minutes to, to appear and disappear, and if it takes, affects both eyes or they're not quite sure, then it's commonly a migraineous or, or an ocular migraine. And here are some lovely pictures of what people see from, uh, from ocular migraines. I get these, I get um, this middle one um, about a couple of times a year, usually not followed by any headaches. It's just sort of lasts a few minutes and then disappears. So any questions on our section of flashes, floaters, PVD, or the retinal anatomy? I will let Jane field any well, questions. At this stage, I really want to encourage people to use the Q&A and ask any question, however basic, don't be shy. I'm going to start with one, and that is, how much can floaters really interfere with someone's vision? Will it ever drop their Snellen vision, or is it just something that's very annoying because it's there and it's floating around? Good question, Jane. Um, 
practically speaking, most of the time we do not see it affecting the Snellen acuity, but occasionally with dense floaters, um, so some people have a really fibrous posterior hyaloid, and you literally see it as a cloud. And if that comes across the fovea, they do drop their acuity slightly. And they're, they're bothered to different degrees by it. Some people don't really care. and Others are very, very symptomatic. So actually it can affect the acuity as well. Although usually it's just the subjective quality of vision sort of. So they could lose things in their vision or not. They could not really. and they frequently describe of their reading. They look down, the floater moves down and they have to keep looking to the side to move it out of the way to continue reading. Right. And will they ever show, one question here, uh, do floaters ever show up as a visual field defect please? I have never come across them uh, doing that. Um, of course, um, the PVD symptoms are often more sort of pronounced in uh, myopic people who will often have tilted discs and peripapillary atrophy, which can give you a uh, visual field defect. So they can go concurrently together. But floaters themselves are very, I haven't come across personally any instance of them giving a field. If you have predominantly unilateral floaters, should you be more worried and secondary, if it's predominantly unilateral, what is your chance of getting unilateral? Um, so with unilateral floaters, again, good question, actually. You need to establish the cause very, very firmly in this. Would you um, be more worried? So um, not necessarily. It depends what they're due to. Um, if there's a clear PVD in that eye and not in the other, that's not worrisome. It just means one eye is slightly ahead of the other. Check the periphery of the retina, make sure there's no trouble, there's no tears, and, that, and that's fine. And just warn them that the same symptoms might appear in the other eye. If there's no PVD in that eye and the floaters are just there and you're not quite sure what they're due to, then you need to think about things like inflammatory causes, weird and wonderful, or maybe hemorrhage in the eye. Um, and this is when probably a referral is more justified because you need to, to look for the cause really. A question here, why do some ophthalmologists tell patients to use dry eye drops to help with their symptoms of floaters? I didn't know they did, but the question's there. Have you come across that, Jen? Well, probably because we like giving them out like candies, the dry eye drops. <laughs> um, uh, because I think because um, you're trying to optimize all of the sort of visual interfaces. So if they have floaters, you're trying to rule out uh, tear film instability uh, as a cause for their blurring. So I would particularly do this if they come to you compla compa um, complaining of episodic blurring. So the blur comes and then it goes and then it comes again. It's very difficult to actually pin down whether that's a floater or whether that's just dryness that's changing with blink frequency. So I would give them dry eye drops. And if the symptoms are unchanged, we're thinking more of the back of the eye. That's fascinating, thank you. One more question here. For a patient with new flashes or floaters, would it be sufficient to rule out a hole or tear with dilated Volk examination or would the patient need indentation or three mirror examination to rule out a tear or hole? I guess we're gonna hear a bit more of that later on in your talk, are we? Yes, but I will answer it now. And I guess this is one of those things of um, uh, a question is how, how, how good is the examiner <laughs> um, and how good is the lens as well? Uh, with a standard 90D, which is probably the most common one, um, you can't quite see all the way to the aura. So I would argue that you probably, you can rule out major things because you're going to see a large tear because it'll extend far enough and you're going to see hemorrhage and things. But small breaks near the aura are very difficult to see with that lens. If you have a wide field, so I have a digital wide field lens, which gives you pretty much aura to aura view uh, with dynamic examination. And actually, I don't use um, contact lenses, and I very rarely use indirect, only in select cases. And I feel that it is enough to rule out pathology. And one more question here. Do we need to refer patients with a vice ring? Um, so again, it's a sort of a risk stratification. I would say that if a patient presents to you with new symptoms of PVD, so that's all the things we talked about, so flashes, floaters, uh, a moving defect in their vision, and those symptoms are a few days up to maybe two or three weeks old, then absolutely do refer 
unless you're 100% certain that you've excluded a retinal tear. And few of us, I guess, are 100% certain that we've excluded a retinal tear. But send them for a check and we'll usually see them within a couple of weeks for a second check. And, and if I see a patient, for example, in the casualty department, who comes to us as a first presentation with those symptoms, I would book them into my clinic for a couple of weeks for a second check. Um, so we never mind checking these patients again. So if you just see a voice ring, but they've got new symptoms, do refer. If you see the voice ring, but they have no new symptoms or their symptoms are months old, we're happy to see them, but that's more of a routine case. Thank you very much, Jen. Well, shall we go on with the next part yep. of your talk? So do keep submitting questions. We'll get to them later, but I'll move on. And we're going back to those vitreous adhesions, those lovely um, poll answers that we got. Here's our diagram of the vitreous fibers again, attaching um, at the ciliary body at the aura serrata. Um, so the fact that the vitreous attaches very firmly around the peripheral retina is the reason we get retinal tears because the vitreous is trying to pull off, but it's attached too strongly uh, to the whole retina around that area. And it just pulls this beautiful U tear there. Um, so, when a patient presents with PVD symptoms, the duration, as I've said already, is the key. Is it hours and days they've been getting their symptoms or is it weeks and months already? You're looking specifically for a change in their symptoms. This is what you're trying to get from the history. And on examination, pretty much the key thing you're looking for is, is tobacco dust. This is pretty highly predictive for a retinal tear. So do look very carefully and get them, do a dynamic exam. So get them to look up and down and around and look for the swirling vitreous to check there's no tobacco dust in the back. If you see no tobacco dust, that's actually fairly reassuring that they're going to be okay. Not 100%, but approaching it. So if the symptoms are longstanding and there's no tobacco dust, we have much less concern. We're happy to see them if you're worried or if the patient wants a second check, but it doesn't need to be urgent. Should all tears be referred and or treated? Well, acute U tears, yes. Um, it's very difficult to do natural history studies on these scientifically because it's not very ethical to leave them and watch them. But somebody did do this back in the days when ethics wasn't quite uh, a thing yet. And they found that about 50% of them progressed to retinal detachment. Um, so a lot of them actually just sit as they are and scar up, which is why we see them sometimes. No detachment and an old looking break. Uh, and they, the chronic u -tears, do we need to treat those? Now, what does a chronic u -tear look like? Well, I've tried to put some pictures of various things in here. Um, so the, this picture down the bottom left is a bit of lattice uh, with some old breaks and also um, this is slightly different. This is an old break with a little operculum. So um, chronic breaks, you probably need to treat um, because it's just a balance of risk. And most patients will elect to treat it. And most doctors will elect to treat it, but it's not quite clear cut. Now, fully operculated breaks. So that's where you get your u -tear, and then the continued traction on the retina by the vitreous, literally just the valsus pulls off the flap of retina. So this is this fully operculated break. This may have been a round hole. This may have been a u -tear, which has just sort of rounded off um, with time because they do all become a bit round with time. And you get this little operculum floating above this little bit of retina. Now, by definition, this has released the traction, released the pull on the edges of the break. So actually, that means that it's now lower risk uh, for developing detachment. Uh, because if you release the pull, there's less chance of the retina coming away. Now, chronic round holes. So this, these two in the middle. Do we need to laser those? Most people will actually leave them. You'll find people lasering them. Um, and my rule of thumb uh, is generally that if the patient presents with acute sudden symptoms of PVD and there's nothing to find in the eye at all except some round holes, I'll probably laser round holes. Uh, but 
if the round holes are an incidental finding and they're not having symptoms, I would leave them. And the reason for that is because laser is not 100% safe. Doing laser increases your chance of developing epiretinal membranes, um, causing problems from that. Um, it's not completely 100% safe. So how do we know the tear is acute? Um, so I said all acute bricks must be lasered. Well, it is all in the history again. How recent are the symptoms? The other clues which can exist is, is there bleeding? If there's bleeding in the vitreous, then it's probably happened quite suddenly because bleeding goes away given time. If there's also little retinal hemorrhages around the edges of the break, that's also a sign of an acute uh, problem. What can indicate chronicity, so the long-standing nature of a break that's been sat there for ages, if it's pigmented? around the edges. So if we go back to our pictures, you can see pigment around that one, although that one I suspect is a, is a laser one. You can see a bit of pigment around this one. Uh, and, and this bottom right one is an acute one. There's no pigment, there's sort of no kind of um, tendency for it to, to stick down. Also, if it's got a little bit of fluid around it, the retina tends to thin out and become really transparent, almost like a retina schisis. Um, which also means that it's quite long standing. And also, if you look at an eye and they've got an epiretinal membrane and you see a retinal break, chances are that break is old because breaks increase the chance of ERM formation and it takes time to form. So that's another little clue, which conversely also means that if you spot an epiretinal membrane, always check the peripheral retina because they not infrequently have retinal breaks. So, Little word on round holes. So here are three round holes. First one, this is a round hole. There's no obvious traction, no pull on the edges. Although actually recent OCT studies have shown that most peripheral round holes will have a bit of traction if you um, run the OCT scan through them. And a little cuff of surrounding subretinal fluid. Say you saw this, say the patient was without any problems, without symptoms, you can quite happily leave that. Very few of them lead to detachment. This is again a round hole, no obvious traction with pigmentation. This has been there a long, long time. This one you definitely leave. This is, you're very happy about this one. And this round hole, no obvious traction. Again, a bigger cuff of subretinal fluid, but you can see pigment all the way around the fluid. And this almost looks like a laser mark and it's not. It's just the fact that this has sat there, this fluid and has not progressed beyond the border. So this one is super long standing. So treatment. How do we treat tears if we find them or holes? We've got laser and we've got cryo. And those are our two main modalities. Vast majority will have lasers. So laser treatment takes a few minutes to do on a slit lamp laser or with an indirect laser option. You tend to use a contact lens um, because that improves your, um, your view. And it's relatively painless. Um, so the patient's discomfort comes from the glare of the bright light. So it's, it's sort of um, celery spasm from, from the glare. Um, the only other time it's painful is if you laser around three and nine o'clock in the retina where the nerves pass and you hit the nerve accidentally. Um, so that can be uncomfortable. And this is what it looks like. You put two, a couple of rows around the any fluid in retinal tear and that's a beautiful laser which will take nicely. It's not 100% treatment, um, so it will not prevent a detachment in 100% of cases, but probably 99%, and that's a well-done laser. Cryotherapy, so it actually takes less time, but you need to give anesthetic because it's more painful. Um, so you give a, usually give a little in subconjunctival injection of anesthetic, and it also allows you to treat the tear in poorer view. So media opacity, cataract, hemorrhage, um, you can still see enough to be able to cryo, but laser will not go through media opacity. So after a PVD or retinopexy, so this is a patient of you, you've either examined and you're happy the retina is fine, or they've come back to you after their eye clinic and they've been told the retina is fine, or they've had a successful retinopexy. Sometimes we forget to tell the patients that their floaters persist. Feel free to advise them that their floaters persist. Um, they don't go anywhere. Um, they become less obvious. Um, but if I find it useful to describe it to patients that it's like a snow globe. 
So if you sit there quietly, they tend to settle at the bottom of the eye. If you shake your head around, they'll float around. But brain adaptation learns to filter them out after a time. Um, and they do settle down with gravity, so they tend to be more obvious in the mornings because you're lying down on, on your back and the floaters settle on your macula. And when you get up, they're a lot more obvious. And also, if they've had a little bit of hemorrhage from their um, retinal break, that disperses after a time and those floaters do go away. Now, flashes can also persist. Um, and this is just due to retinal stimulation. Remember, the vitreous never completely detaches. And so uh, the persistent wobble of the jelly and the persistent small tugs at the vitreous base can give you flashes, which can keep persisting. So they shouldn't worry too much about any of those, but focus on any new or change in symptoms. So if the floaters are flashing are getting worse. OK, so any questions on that section from the audience? Does it relate partly to floaters and partly to the tear? It has a small immobile floater in the far periphery. So if a patient is A, and then there's a gap symptomatic, but has a small immobile floater in the far periphery, should we refer? Not quite sure I can answer that one. Um, so uh, if the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic, mm. if they're... Well, I think it should be symptomatic. And um, if the patient is symptomatic and the symptoms are recent, please do refer. If the patient is asymptomatic, so not having any problems, and you yourself notice a little floater, chances are that's either a vitreous strand or maybe a smaller perculum from a round hole. So in that case, we can see, but if, you, if you're not seeing a detachment, I'm happy to see that routinely. Great, thank you. What does white with pressure and white without pressure mean when investigating retinal tears? Yeah, so these are slightly confusing sort of archaic terms. They're descriptive, really. Um, white with pressure is our normal state. If you press on, the, on any human tissue, you collapse bl the thin blood vessels in the tissue you're pressing. If you press on your skin, it becomes white and you release the pressure, it's white for another second and then it comes back to pink or uh, the, the color uh, flushes. Um, but in the, re and in the retina, the same thing happens. So if you press on the outside of the globe, you can blanch um, the retina slightly and you can see that on an indented exam. And that's a normal state. Uh, white without pressure is when it looks like that without you doing anything to the eye. Um, so you more frequently find that in highly pigmented retinas and it's just the peripheral feature where you get a sort of a demarcation line posteriorly to which the retina is fairly pigmented, or the, the RPE I should say is fairly pigmented and anteriorly to that it looks paler. And it's, we know that it presents a slightly increased risk for developing retinal tears. Uh, but we don't routinely continue monitoring that in clinic unless, like I say, they're developing symptoms. Should we peripheral holes? Uh, so, so um, which one was that? Sorry, Jane, you... Should we refer small round peripheral holes? So small round holes, again, this is sort of a little bit of a bone of contention because different surgeons will have different preferences on this. Um, I would say that if the patient has new symptoms, refer. If the patient is concerned and wants a check, refer. If you are concerned and want to check, refer. However, if you're quite happy that it's a retinal hole with pigment around it and the patient is asymptomatic, then it doesn't necessarily need to be seen because as I said, they very rarely cause problems, but we're always happy to reassure if you need us to. A, a general question, but of great importance, how urgently do we need to refer these patients? So I think that means within a week, within two days, within a day. What's the timing of this, please? So I would say any acute symptoms of PVD that you want checking. Um, so the patient's presenting within hours, days, or maybe a couple of weeks of, of their symptoms. Um, well, ideally, I want to see them there and then. But uh, realistically, um, it depends if you're sending to an NHS clinic, we're going to see them within two weeks or ask them to come to a walk-in casualty. Um, obviously, in the private setting, we can usually see them on that day or the next day. 
Um, if if they're more long-standing, then obviously, like I said, it's a more routine case. And then an interesting question here from David: How does contact lens help you with laser therapy? So the contact lens. So with the bright flashes of the laser. So you, the the laser light itself is non-visible spectrum, uh, but the the um, well, it is actually it's it's sort of far green, um, but it's so bright that it promotes the uh, blink reflex and the startle reflex. And if you keep having to refocus on where you're lasering between each burn, it will take you hours. So a contact lens allows them to blink with the other eye, but the treated eye, the blink happens around the lens and doesn't disrupt your view. So you can do the laser within a few minutes. Thank you. One last question for this section. Sudden onset mobile spiders and cobwebs in your vision, but no flashes and no shadow or curtain. Refer, question mark. Refer. Um, back at the beginning of the presentation, I was saying that any or all of these symptoms can mean any or all of the problems. Uh, so any combination or symptoms in isolation of flashes, floaters, blurry vision, um, that's new or, a, or a, a shadow, can be just PVD, can be retinal tear, can be detachment. And I've seen them all present in any combination of the above. So I'm happy to see cobwebs that are acute. Thank you. So move on. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, so when retinal tears progress, this is, we're getting to the more exciting stuff now. Um, so, they may progress straight to detachment. So the patient comes into you, they've already got their detachment. They, they either ignore their floaters, didn't notice them, or it progressed quickly and um, that they're already there. Um, if they've had previous treatments, so say they've had a PEXI before, or maybe even a retinal detachment operation before, they may not get any new symptoms and just develop a detachment out of the blue. Um, so anyone coming in with a new shadow, no matter how they're describing it. So I've had a patient recently say, oh, I've got a bubble in my vision. Um, but always do investigate, always check. Um, a little aside to sort of anatomy again and physiology. How does the retina normally remain stuck? Um, you've got a sort of a gluing effect from the glycoproteins in the, um, in the jelly. The cells have little outpouchings, have little fingers, microvilli, which kind of stick together almost like Velcro, and that helps as well. And this is between the retina and the RP. But actually the biggest sticking effect, the strongest glue is the vacuum force. Uh, put vacuum in the vertical commas, it's not strictly vacuum, but it's that sticking force, which is created by the active action of the RP cells of the retinal pigment epithelium pumping out the water from underneath the retina, from the potential space between the retina and the RP. So, and the vitreous, it's important, the, um, the vitreous does not push on the retina. The vitreous is not an active sort of piston or a pump. It's just sitting there. The only thing it can do is pull. Um, so normal homostasis, here we go. Here's the RPE pumping out the water on the left, keeping the retina attached just through that sucking force. Um, and which is why any perturbations in the RPE cause fluid buildup. So this is your uh, choroidal neovascularization with the RPE being broken and leaking blood vessels. Um, you know, this is your inflammation where the junctions between the cells become leaky and again, you get fluid buildup. And um, so it all comes back to um, the anatomy. Um, so what types of detachments can you get? How can you get a buildup of fluid underneath the retina? Well, first and most famous is your regmatogenous. A regma means hole, um, so it's a, a, a retinal hole in, which allows the water inflow from the vitreous space on into the space underneath the retina and the inflow of water overwhelms the RPE pump. It keeps pumping, it keeps trying to dry it out, but the ship sinks because it can't keep up. Then you have the exudative detachments, and this is uh, where you have a, a leaky RPE, sorry RPE not PRE, um, so the pump is somehow defective. And this is where the fluid production just outstrips outflow for that reason. Then you have tractional detachments and this is where you literally, something's pulling in the retina. So this is our either proliferative vitreoretinopathy, so fibrosis because of a retinal break or detachment, 
or the fibrosis you get in diabetic disease. And it's literally pulling the retina up and it's overwhelming the, the, all the sticking forces. Um, and there's no breaks, um, but it keeps pulling. And then you get the combined, which is where you get the several mechanisms together. Most typically, it's the tractional regmatodulus. So it's a, the pull, and the pull also generates a break in the retina, at which point the whole thing becomes much more unstable and progresses faster. You also get skysis detachments. So what do you need for retinal detachment? For a typical regmatogenous retinal detachment, you need a hole and you need traction. This is why round holes rarely produce detachments because they have a little bit of traction on them, but not very much at all. There's nothing lifting the edges of the hole. And so the fluid doesn't want to go through it. Uh, according to Poiseuille's law, it's not going to go through that small break unless it's being helped by the hole edges being elevated. So this little graphic, I thought that was very nice with the, um, the pull uh, of the vitreous that comes away during the PVD being demonstrated. How urgent is fixing a detachment? Well, again, you're coming back to, is it new or is it old? And you need to be guided by patient symptoms. So if a patient comes in and they've had symptoms for two days and you see a detachment, just send it in. Um, macula on or off, obviously. Um, so macula on, we would like to try an acute macula on. So a macula on detachment that's just happened, we would want to fix within 24 hours. That's the guidelines, and that's what we try to stick to. There are some caveats with that, but that's sort of more for, for us to decide uh, clinically, but that's the general rule. Once the macula is off, you still want to fix it quickly, but you've got days or weeks to play with, in which case you don't get visual deterioration. Um, now, what are the prognostic factors for the detachment getting worse and progress progressing? This is the sort of caveats we look at when deciding on urgency. So location of the detachment. If the detachment's at the top of the retina, it's going to progress faster because gravity helps it get worse. So an inferior detachment, we might sit on for a little while and operate at a more leisurely pace. You look for these called watermarks, so pigment edges to the detachment, which can indicate chronicity, the so long-standing nature of the detachment. And also what we always want to know is whether the break in the retina is a U-tear, so one of these acute PVD related things, or a round hole. And round hole detachments, this is your typical myopic young patient who has no symptoms. You look in their eye, they've got a detachment, there's a round hole in it, they're not aware of a problem. Um, and, you know, these ones are the ones um, that tend to progress very slowly, if at all. So we've got time. To play with these. However, if in doubt about any of this, just send them in. Send them in urgently and we can assess and we can make that judgment. So this is an acute detachment. You've got this lovely big break. The retina is all really opaque. You can't see through it very well. You can't appreciate the RPE features underneath. That means the retina is a dermatist and that means this is a fresh detachment as opposed to one of these. This has been there for yonks. It's uh, not my, this is probably years old. Uh, the arrows indicate lattice with a few little holes in it. And there's a great big tide mark, water mark here, the pigmented edge of the subretinal fluid. And you can't see any subretinal fluid progressing beyond it. So this has been there a long time. It's been stable. Some of these we will actually watch in clinic rather than do anything about because they may remain stable. Um, so a few sort of special cases just for interest. This one on the top left is a GRT, a giant retinal tear. These are great fun to fix. Um, they are more likely to happen in myopes, people with lattice degeneration. So the whole retina just unzips along the edge. And in order for a, a retinal break to qualify as a GRT, it has to be at least three clock hours of retina. And um, they require slightly more sort of specialized surgery to fix. Uh, and these ones, this is a dialysis. So this is where the retina, where you get that strong adhesion uh, of the vitreous around the aura serrata, the vitreous base, the retina just unzips at the vitreous base. These are often traumatic. They can often be stable long-term, 
Sometimes you just get the dialysis and no detachment and they can sit there for years. They often won't have a PVD and the patient may not know they've got one. Uh, and you see this in kids as well. Um, so this can be sort of an asymptomatic finding. Um, then you get some of the other weird ones. This is a, a macular hole detachment. The patient had a macular hole, either idiopathic, spontaneous or traumatic. And they've developed a detachment because that has allowed the fluid in. So this is more sort of a myopic scenario, um, but you can get these. So, so if you can't find a break, do check the macula. And this is a tractional detachment. I'm sure you've all seen pictures. This is a diabetic eye. The disc is somewhere under there on the left. And you've got all of these fibrous strands, which is your neovascular complexes. So your NVE and your NVD, that's sort of fibrosed up and you see some active new vessels at the top there and bleeding. So this is a, um, this leads to one of our more complex operations of vitrectomy delamination to fix that, but you can't see any breaks. And this is just a little um, picture of an exudative IT. This is a patient with a condition called VKH, von Konyagi Harada. It's an interesting condition where your immune system effect, um, attacks uh, your, um, basically your melanin cells. So cells that contain pigment in the body and the patients get system, symptoms all over the body uh, to do with their skin, to do with their hair and also to do with their eyes. And you get these little um, exudative detachments, little lumps and bumps and blisters under the retina. And the treatment here is not surgical. It's anti-inflammatories, it's steroids. So what are the risk factors of a detachment? Myopia, most of us will know that. Um, previous detachment, same eye or other eye. Family history of detachment is actually quite strongly genetic. Um, there are some syndromes that come into it, of course, sticklers being the most famous, but even in the absence of a, of a particular syndrome, uh, family history is important. Trauma, um, so any kind of bash to the eye at any point in life increases the risk of detachment. Cataract surgery or other intraocular surgery for that matter. Um, with cataract surgery, the types of break you often see, I mean, I don't think this is sort of scientifically proven, but intraoperatively you tend to see tiny breaks near the aura so they're quite difficult to pick up and you often just patients often present just with a detachment to start with um, and also infections and inflammations in the eye which are more rare things and then you've got all the other rare things which lead to more to tractional and detachments and exudative ones such as diabetes fevr and coats so how do we fix it well we've got a choice we can do the good old fashioned operation called cryotherapy or scleral buckle, or we can do a vitrectomy. Both will work for most attachments, and we still do both. Um, nowadays, most surgeons in the UK will tend to do a vitrectomy in cases with a PVD and classic tractional breaks, so your UTEs, and will tend to do scleral buckling in the eyes with non-PVD related breaks. So those are your round holes and retinal dialysis primarily. But you can combine the approaches. You can do a vitrectomy with a buckle. And this is more complex detachments such as PVR cases. Cryotherapy and scleral buckle, what do we do? It's quite an old fashioned op. It's been around for decades. It's done under general anesthetic because you're yanking the eye around quite a lot and it's uncomfortable. You open the conjunctiva, you find the rectine muscles, you grab them, which allows you to move the eye, and then you look for your breaks. When you find your breaks, you decide what little implant you're going to put in in order to, for it to be big enough to support the breaks. You, you put some sutures in the wall of the eye to hold your implant. Then you do cryotherapy to treat the retinal breaks that you found. And then you tie your explant, your rubber tire, while well, your silicon tire firmly down so that it creates an indent in the eye wall and what that does is it changes the vectors of the tractional forces it redistributes them so that the pull on the brake is reduced and you've frozen it so it's going to stick back down to the rpe and hopefully the attachment will be fixed you make sure the pressure is all right at the end and uh, the pressure in the eye check all as well check the um that the central retinal artery is perfused Sometimes we will drain the fluid, but a lot of the time we won't. Sometimes we'll put a bubble of air in, but a lot of the time we won't. So I forgot to give a warning for the squeamish. Here is a um, 
some sutures being tied around an implant. At the top, you can see a sling going across a rectus muscle, pulling it up. We're tying down the implant, which is around the outside wall of the eye. And you can see the buckling of the sclera around it, which means there'll be a nice high indent, okay? There'll be one more video for the squeamish straight after this slide, in case you want to look away. Um, just talking about vitrectomy now. So this is probably the majority of the operations for detachment, vitrectomy, cryotherapy, and gas. So you've got your three port access using our trocar. So anything between 23 gauge to 27 gauge nowadays, I tend to use 25 gauge. So they're very, very small, sort of um, a very, very narrow um, gauge trocars. Um, they're valved, so there's no leakage out. You go in with your keyhole instruments, you get rid of the vitreous, you find the breaks from the inside using a focusing lens and microscope looking through the pupil. You freeze the breaks or you laser them. Then you exchange the fluid from underneath the retina and inside the eye for air. So the eye is now filled with air. Do any more treatment that you need. And then you swap the air for special gas. So the gases we'll use, you will have heard about, um, sort of less relevant for this talk, SF6, C2FA, C3FA, C2F6. Um, they all have different durations inside the eye. And it's usually sutureless. Sometimes we'll stitch the pores, but usually sutureless. So here comes the video. Um, so this is one of my videos from my YouTube channel, which you're welcome to check out. Most of them are annotated to talk about the steps. Um, I will just fast forward through it at certain points because it does take a little bit of time, even though it's edited. So this is the first port going in um, with the trocar. So it is um, valved. It goes in at an angle so that the um, you don't need to put sutures in because the valve just closes off at the end. So in it goes. And then you put in the other port uh, in a similar fashion. And then you connect your infusion line and then you look through the pupil. And this is what you see. This is a lovely bullous detachment. This is a total retinal detachment. So the whole retina is um, floating about. This is a vitrectum, uh, which sucks and cuts the vitreous to remove it safely with minimal traction. So as you're not producing new breaks as you're doing that. So here we go all the way around the eye, removing the vitreous. Uh, all the way around. You can see it's like smoke. You can see the vitreous bobbing around. And this is indented search. So I'm pressing on the outside of the eye to bring the peripheral retina into view. And the retinal breaks tend to stand up proud so that you can see where they are. Um, so you do this all the way around the eye really carefully. Make sure you're not missing any small breaks that are going to cause trouble. Um, here we go. We found the break. The thing that's glowing orange there, it's a hole in the retina, so you've identified it. So once you've identified the break, what we tend to do is we mark it. Um, and then this is your vitrector. So you're literally sucking out. Um, ah, this is a... Um, this is a retinotomy. So this is where I make another hole in the retina in order to drain the fluid because the break is too anterior, too far forward. You can't drain the fluid very effectively from it. So you make another break to do that and then you treat them both. So the retina is flattening, flattening, flattening as the air is coming into the eye and the fluid is being removed. Here's the air bubble coming into the eye. And you flatten the retina nicely so that it's sitting well against the wall of the eye. And then you're going to freeze the break that you've created and the original break so that that creates inflammation and sticks the retina down. Here's the freezing probe pressing from the outside of the eye. You see a nice white reaction in a second um, that tells you that the treatment's working. There we go, that's cryotherapy and you've treated the break. Um, and then you will remove your ports. And this is me swapping the air for gas. And that's that. So what do you do with a patient who's had one of these ops? Well, the vitrectomy is usually quite a comfortable op. Uh, afterwards, they don't tend to get very much pain unless you put some sutures in, in which case it can be a bit sore. Um, if so, which, which means that if it is very sore, we need to see them. 
posturing is usually the biggest bugbear with patients. So they may be asked to posture. It depends on the rotator detachment. It depends on the surgeon. Um, but it is it is fairly important if they can if they can manage it. And also, it's important to explain to the patient, which we sometimes uh, sometimes do forget, is that they get all sorts of get visual effects from the gas. So initially, they have no vision through the gas. Afterwards, they get a black line that comes down. It can split off into multiple bubbles, and that puts some people off. Um, but all of these are completely normal. And the other thing to bear in mind is that when you give patients post-operative steroids, which we tend to always do, 20% of them will get a, a pressure rise from that. And they will get a pressure rise typically at about two weeks, 10 days, two weeks, which is why we usually see them at that point. Um, now, and also, obviously, everybody will get a cataract after vitrectomy, or almost everybody. If you've got a little bit of predisposing nucleosclerosis, this will continue to develop and form a cataract. If you have a completely clear lens, you will actually mostly get away with it for, for quite a few years. But we would only operate on a post vitrectomy cataract when the patient becomes aware of the visual decline. So if you spot a cataract, it doesn't necessarily need to come out if the patient hasn't noticed a change. If they've had a macula off detachment, they might not notice a cataract for quite a while. Questions on the detachment section. We're almost finished now, um, not much longer after this. After cataract operation, this is from Monique, I always see small remnants in the vitreous. How can I distinguish them from tobacco dust? Excellent question. Actually, very excellent question. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if there was a bit of iris trauma during cataract surgery, which is not infrequent, you get pigment. Now, the pigment won't be in the back of the vitreous, it'll be in the anterior vitreous. Well, that's quite difficult to distinguish on the slit lamp. Um, I would say that if the patients had intraocular surgery um, and, and this is an incidental finding of pigment, so they're not sort of aware of any change in symptoms, I'd be a little bit more relaxed about it. I would absolutely check the peripheral retina, but if you can't see anything obvious, just be a bit more relaxed about it. Perhaps, uh, you know, if you want to double check, refer them in routinely, or the most important thing is to give the patient a really good warning of retinal detachment symptoms. Because if after cataract surgery, they have one of these tiny little retinal breaks right near the aura, you may not be able to spot it. I may not be able to spot it. But if the patient knows that they start to get a shadow, they come in straight away, we can still keep the Mac on a lot of the time. That leads in very nicely to the next question. What kind of physical activity might speed or, or even slow down a hole into a full tear? What to avoid if suspected? Another very good question. And this is actually, this is actually like a personal interest of mine. Um, so the junior doctors that work with us in clinics often tell patients in casualty, oh, you must not do anything. You must sit still and not move your head and not do anything at all. And actually that's not really correct. If you think about it mechanistically, if you think about what's happening, what do we need for a detachment? We need a hole and we need traction. We need two things. We've got the hole already. You can't change that. The traction is what matters. What is going to increase the traction? Well, really sudden jerks of the vitreous. So you can imagine it's gonna pull more. So anything that causes a rapid acceleration or deceleration, which is why we're not so keen on the bungee jumping in these patients. Ordinary standard exercise, a sort of a casual jog or housework, I mean, it depends how vigorous you are with housework, is not gonna really do anything. But I would, I usually advise patients to avoid thing, contact sports of boxing or a lot of rugby or rapid deceleration events such as um, your bungee jumping. Everything else is mostly okay. From Anonymous, patient presented with symptoms of black dots in vision from time to time. Together with a streak of white light in the temporal field of a left eye, but only noticed when going up and down the stairs. Any thoughts on this? Dilated examination showed no breaks. So this sounds like a PVD related symptom. So peripheral white light and little dots. If you can't see anything and they keep getting it and keep getting it, I would quite happily check that. Again, I don't think you need to sort of rush them in that day, but I would quite happily check that just to be 
extra sure there's nothing going on. And it maybe it's just PVD and probably is just PVD. How important is lattice degeneration in the risk of detachment? Thanks. That's from Rupal. Yeah, lattice is important. Lattice is a significant risk factor. However, I personally do not prophylactically treat lattice. The reason for that is, as I alluded to before, uh, because laser is not 100% safe in all cryotherapy, and you can get epiretinal membrane formation, which can be more symptomatic than a retinal detachment that never forms. So if I see a break in the lattice, absolutely treat it. Um, but if the lattice is just sitting there, um, especially in, if it's in the other eye, for instance, and it's entirely asymptomatic, I, I wouldn't touch it. I would also not monitor it. I would, again, just give the patient really thorough retinal detachment warning. Just check your eyes one at a time regularly. Any change in symptoms present to us. Um, lattice has those vitreous condensations above it. And people often think that that's a retinal tear because it can look a bit like that. And again, we don't mind checking that just to make double sure. But it can often fool you because it's got those vitreous condensations sitting right above it. And just a couple of questions relating directly to the surgery. Um, vitrectomy is under local anaesthetic or general anaesthetic? Vitrectomy is under local anaesthetic in the majority of patients, unless they're very anxious or there's some other sort of reason for, to put them to sleep. It's, it's pretty painless with a subtenon's block. Some patients get a bit of sedations if they're anxious, but most patients are very pleasantly surprised that they don't feel much. You've already talked about the risk of cataract after vitro-retinal surgery, after vitrectomy. Do you ever take the lens out at the same time as doing the vitrectomy? Yeah, so I would take the lens out at the same time do a fake of vitrectomy if I cannot see. So right. if the view is impeded enough by the cataract to stop you accurately locating the breaks. Um, or, of course, if there's any incidental lens trauma during vitrectomy, which is actually pretty rare. Um, and then would you do a secondary intraocular lens implant later? Correct, yeah. The, re the other reason for that is because if you combine cataract and vit vitrectomy surgery, they do get more inflammation afterwards. And this is quite clearly shown. I give them a lot more steroids afterwards if they've had combined surgery. So actually, a staged procedure, paradoxically, is often kinder to the eye. So I tend to split it, um, if possible. And then a couple of very short questions on the aftermath of retinal detachment. Um, much double and is there any macular distortion post retinal detachment if the macula has been off? Is that a problem? Uh, da, 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 sorry. Um, so the first one is double vision after retinal detachment. See that. So the double vision after detachment is much more of an issue with scleral buckles. Here you pretty much expect them to get double vision if you've done a good buckle. And that's to do with the muscle, muscle disruption and the change in eye position. In buckling surgery, that tends to settle, but it does take a few months. So you warn them about that during the consent process. It's very rare to get that after vitrectomy. And that mostly relates to lens changes, but also if you've got, uh, if you've had a, a macula off detachment, you get the retinal shift because the retina ah, comes away you. and it stretches, doesn't quite sit down in the same spot. And some people can get double vision from that. And that's, a, that's really tricky because you can't really fix that with prisms because the shift is not orthogonal. It's, it's sort of a twist and a shift and, and it's very tricky to manage sometimes. Okay, there's a, a few more questions. Would you mind taking two or yeah, sure. How to differentiate retinal detachment skysis effectively? We're going to get to that. I'm going to have okay. that one. And then the next one, the pivot trial showed reduced retinal detachment. Do you think it will be adopted more in the UK? That's from Yeah. I think I think it means um, uh, I think it means uh, you or you mean reduced retinal displacement. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, my fellow who's working with me now is 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 involved with that. Um, yeah, 
so first thing to say, it showed reduced retinal displacement, but not really being reflected in patients. Tell us what the PIVOT trial is, because not, possibly not everybody knows. Yes, so, uh, so this looks at a pneumatic retinopexy, which is basically not doing a vitrectomy. If you get a retinal detachment, this relates to quite a small subset of detachments which are eligible for it. Usually single break superior, but you can do other ones. And you don't do a vitrectomy, you just inject uh, gas in and treat the breaks so and it it, it does work it works nicely um, it does reduce the retinal displacement but it's not reflected robustly enough in improvements in patient symptoms this is sim similar to the post rd study from moorfields under J david charteris which also showed with posturing that you can make the pictures look pretty and the octs look pretty but it doesn't really translate to visual function very well um, so we probably should be using um, pneumatic displacement more uh, retin and pneumatic retinopexy. The difficulty with it is follow-up. You need to check these patients almost daily for a week or two. And that is impossible to do in an NHS clinic and very tricky to do in a lot of private settings as well because we're not usually there every day. There's a question here from Yolanda Gujaro Cazorla. Can a patient with a retinal hole or tear it's a very practical question, increase their risk of retinal detachment by changes in pressure, such as in flying or scuba diving? Yeah, no, <laughs> um, not at all, because the eye is an isolated environment, changes in pressure, they, they don't really do anything to the vitreous. The only thing that matters are holes and internal traction. Uh, this is the same sort of question as, um, uh, pregnant ladies who ask will giving birth make me make my retina fall off because a lot of um we used to think that many decades ago and a lot of eastern bloc countries still think that um so i'm russian by origin i get russian patients coming to me thinking that i'm gonna support uh, that um belief but unfortunately i have to dissuade them because there's absolutely no proof of that now you can have retinal hemorrhages from straining but you can't really get a detachment. It doesn't, it doesn't, the pressure does not transmit in that fashion. Fantastic. Two more very short questions. Are there sequelae with buckling? Um, in terms of uh, side effects of surgery uh, or in terms of, I mean, yeah, absolutely. In, in, in both terms, in fact, I mean, side effects of surgery, as I mentioned, double vision is a big one. Buckling is a sore procedure. They're swollen. They're red, they're sore. It takes a lot longer to settle than a vitrectomy. But the benefit of buckling is that you're not going in the eye and therefore you're not getting a cataract. And so this is why we tend to do it in younger patients more. Um, so you can absolutely get lots of sort of, um, lots of patient sort of concerns about it. Um, and of course the retina can redetach and the redetachment rate is similar for, the, for vitrectomy and buckling and it's about 10%. I assume also with buckling, they become, it's a longer eyeball afterwards, and they become more myopic. Their refraction can change. In fact, it does change. However, in the UK, we tend to do segmental buckling rather than encirclement. So, oh, right. Uh, encirclement induces a permanent refractive error, but segmental buckling, the refractive error settles to the pre-op uh, pre number by about three months. Lovely, thank you. There's another question on buckling. Can buckling be used effectively for inferior detachments? Absolutely. In fact, that's our mainstay of buckling. The classic um, operation, the classic patient that we would buckle in the UK is a young myope with an asymptomatic inferior round hole detachment. Lovely, thank you. And then a question, when do you use silicon oil for treatment, please? So silicon oil, um, is a worse tamponade agent than gas. Gas is a better tamponade agent. Now, what does a tamponade agent do? This may not be interesting to everyone. I'm going aside slightly, but, um, but I love talking about this. Um, how does a tamponade agent work? It excludes fluid from around the brake while the brake is sticking down. Cryotherapy or laser takes several days to induce enough inflammation for the retina to stick. During that time, you need to keep the area dry. Same as when you're gluing something. You need to hold it together and not wet it. So 
gas is a superior tamponade agent to oil, which is why we use it. We use oil when we're going to need a longer tamponade because all gases disappear spontaneously. When we want a longer tamponade, the cases where that happens is usually when you've got PVR. So when you've got uh, fibrous tractional changes, when you've got proliferative retinopathy developing, because the cycle of PVR is about six to eight weeks. It takes six to eight weeks for PVR to mature. All gases will be gone by then. Um, and the PVR will pull the retina off unopposed. If you put oil in, it provides a little bit of extra tamponade to reduce the lift of the retina. So you can get a detachment under the silicon oil, but it will not tend to progress so fast. So you can wait for that scarring to mature. You can go back in as a second procedure, remove the scar tissue and flatten the retina. Jen, you're getting more questions about retinal detachment surgery. I'm not sure whether that means things are becoming <laughs> clearer or less clear. <laughs> Is it possible to have a retinal detachment without a retinal tear and any other vitreoretinal pathology? Uh, without a tear, of course, you can get tractional and exudative ones. Um, if you see a detachment and you can't find a break, chances are there is a break, but it's very small. Um, so that's when a vitrectomy has great advantages because that magnified internal search lets you find breaks very effectively, even tiny ones. And it's rare where we can't um, identify a break intraoperatively. However, if you can't identify a break intraoperatively, you don't give up. Uh, there's a nice technique where you in inject dye and do a sort of, um, you know, like when you repair a bike tire and you put it underwater and you look for a leak. We do the same thing with dye and there's a video on my YouTube channel if you want to check it out. And usually that finds a break for you. So it's almost unheard of to not find a break. Sanji's got one more question here. Do you find that heavy liquids can reduce the incidence of macular folds? So yeah, I know, I know what you're getting at here. So um, heavy liquids are lovely. So this is PFCR, perfluorocarbons. We use them to flatten the retina out. Um, they're classically used if you're doing retinectomy, so cutting the edge of the retina with a lot of scarring in order to flatten it. And also in GRT, giant retinal tear surgery, where you're flattening the retina out before you're sticking it down with laser. Some places, for example, in Italy, they use it routinely in all detachments in order to exclude all the fluid from under the retina. You don't need to do this because the, if you've sealed the break, the RP pump will remove the fluid from under the retina in hours, not, not even days. Um, I once had a machine breakdown during surgery and, and left fluid under the retina and sat there waiting for the machine to work again for about half an hour, went back into the eye and there was no fluid. The eye had already done its job for us. Um, so you don't need to make the retina completely flat and putting extra um, agents into the eye, uh, one prolongs operation time, which is a worse outcome in, by, in its own right. Um, and two, PFCL is actually quite pro-inflammatory. So if you end up leaving a little bit behind, and God forbid, if any gets under the retina, then you're going to be in worse trouble than you started with. Uh, so I only use it if I really need it. Jen, we have the most important question has just come up here. I think everybody <laughs> wants to know this. What's your YouTube channel called? If you, just, if you just search for my name in Google, it's just under uh, Andre Evgenia Nikita. Um, I can also put, I can hunt down the... And can you hand write it on your... Oh. Yes, I can hand down a link and send it round. Could you do that? It. That'd be great. The presentation, yes. <laughs> oh, and David has said spasiba. <laughs> Right, I've got a really short aside on skysis because I've had a couple of questions on skysis. So I'm going to just run through the skysis um, with you to conclude the session. So when is a detachment not a detachment? Going back to our anatomy. So looking at all the layers, all the cell bodies and the, uh, the cell processes. There are potential cleavage planes, so weak interfaces in the retina between the nerve fiber layer um, and the um, ganglion cells. Um, also, so also at the um, outer plexiform layer between the photoreceptors and the um, matrix cells and at the retina RP. So thinking of that, what is a retina skysis? Um, 
well, you can get it congenital or acquired, so you can be born with it, or you can get it later in life. Congenital, we're mainly talking about our XLRS. So this is the X-linked retina schisis, and you've probably all sort of heard about it, but not many of you would have seen it. It's not that common. The split here is in the ganglion cell layer, so it is uh, basically in the um, uh, inner layer of the retina. Uh, acquired retina schisis can be degenerative, um, which is typ typical and reticular, and this is just the typical one, as it says on the tin, you get this most commonly in the reticular um, is a higher split. We'll see it on the picture in a second. This just has sort of prognostic factors for us rather than diagnostic sort of um, factors for you. And you can also get secondary. So you can get schisis because of something. You can get it because you have a large staphyloma, like a high myope, and you develop an epiretinal membrane, which starts to split your retina uh, at the macula just because of the tractional forces. You can get because of it because of disc pit maculopathy and leakage from the disc pit and you get tractional schisis such as in diabetics and the pull of the fibrous tissue splitting the retina. So just looking a little bit into the degenerative retina schisis, the typical degenerative, you get a thicker inner leaf because the split is in that mid layer of the retina. It is common, it's bilateral in over 80% and it usually affects infratemporal retinal quadrants. So this is the kind of typical thing you'll see. If you find something that looks a bit like a detachment, but it's in the infratemporal quadrant, check the other eye. And if they've got another one there, you can actually usually relax about it. The reticular schisis, you get a really thin leaf. It splits just below the nerve fiber layer. It's more rare, more rarely bilateral. And this is also the type that you get in this XLRS. So this is slightly more worrisome because XLRS can be progressive. How do you tell? Well, is it a detachment? Is it a schisis? Is it bilateral? You can get bilateral detachments, absolutely, but it's more likely to be a schisis if it's bilateral. They're often asymptomatic. So are they having symptoms? No, more likely to be a schisis. Hypermetropes. I was told when I was training, never diagnose a, never diagnose a retinal schisis in a myope. And I've tried to stick to that, unless it's a special case such as the staphyloma, the, the fovea schisis. So hypermetropes with bilateral bubbles in the infratemporal quadrants who are asymptomatic. Um, they get this, this sort of described complete scotoma. Now, this is a little bit of a red herring. So this is where you make your slit lamp light with the Volk lens, really, really tiny, a tiny dot. And you move it gradually from flat retina into the bubble. And you ask the patient to tell you as soon as the light disappears. And if they tell you that the light is, has disappeared just as you cross into the schisis area, that's a complete scotoma. So they still, if, they, if it's a detachment, they'll tell to, they tend to still see the light, although it's a bit more diffuse. This is a, red, a little bit of a red herring because a really chronic detachment has been there a long time, they'll get a complete scotoma as well. Now OCT, this is kind of obvious. Nowadays we've all got OCT, right? A lot of us have OCT. Scan the thing get them to look off center and do an OCT cut through the area. And you will see, you will see that the outer retina is still stuck down to the RPE, but there's a big cavity in the middle where the schisis cavity is. Can a schisis progress? Yeah. The degenerative, the common type is usually stable, but myopic fovea schisis, which is this picture on the right, absolutely can progress. Unfortunately, if it progresses, there's not too much we can do, but if it gets very bad, we can offer surgery. Um, or if it develops a concurrent detachment. And this is a lovely picture of a schisis detachment. This outer, retin outer retinal break, outer leaf break, is a break in just the outer layers of the retin, not the inner layers. And these can be present and they're sitting there nicely and stable the, the whole life. And then you develop an inner leaf break. And suddenly you've got communication all the way through the retina and you get a detachment concurrent with the schisis. And these are unstable and these do need surgery. More schisis reading. This was an article I published um, with Paul Sullivan uh, looking into schisis. So you can access that, we can send you the link which goes into a little bit more detail. Um, little word on vitreous hemorrhage as well. This is when a detachment, not a detachment. So if this happens in a diabetic patient, it's not particularly urgent. We want to see them in a few weeks but if you can see, if you can rule out a retinal detachment, sort of, you just wait for it to settle a lot of the time. In anyone else who getting a vitreous hemorrhage 
it's an emergency. And by emergency, I mean same day. I treat these the same as I do my macula on retinal detachments. So if the retinal view is good and you can't see any problem, there's just a bit of blood floating around, you can wait, but I would rather that that waiter was me uh, who can watch and wait and make decisions on it. If there's no retinal view, they need an ultrasound, they need to come under us. Um, if the ultrasound is normal, I still treat these as macula on detachments because you cannot exclude retinal tears on ultrasound. There can be one hiding, you can brew a detachment under the hemorrhage. Now, sometimes an ultrasound can show a submacular bleed. This is also urgent because nowadays, if this has happened within a, a week or two, we can, get, we can do pneumatic displacement and TPA, so a clot busting drug, bubble of gas, try to shift the hemorrhage away from the fovea before it becomes fibrotic and drops the vision permanently. So these are also urgent. This is why any vitreous hemorrhage, especially in the retinal view, is urgent same day. Quiz time. Five questions. I'm going to go to the polls. So uh, here we go. Which of the following is not a type of retinal detachment? Answers on a postcard. This is where I see who's been listening. Most people have been listening, very good. Some people always do fall asleep, but that's all right. It's been a long talk, it's been a long day. Good, good. Lovely. I think those still thinking, we'll let them, we'll let them think a bit more. All right, I'm gonna end that now and I'm gonna take that. Most people were correct. Exfoliative is not a detachment. So let's have that. Let's go to the polls again. And let's go to question four. Here we go. In PVD related flashes of photopsy, which of the following is not true? Sorry. There we go. You may vote at liberty. A few people are really listening. Causing a little bit more thinking this one. I like it. I'll give you another 10 seconds. Okay, I think we'll... Uh... Oh, a few more people, last minute decisions. Good, we'll end it there. So, um, flashes occur in the center of the vision. So, in PVD related flashes, they are of an arc of crescent shape in the temporal field. They're usually very brief. They're often white or off-white and they happen in one eye. Though some people are a bit confused about where they see them, but, but if, you, if you sort of drill down into it, it is one eye. They're not in the center. They're usually temporal. If someone's talking about central flashes, just make sure they haven't got other symptoms which sound like ocular migraine. So uh, next question. Which of the following requires urgent treatment? In other words, which of these is acute? Which of these is of short duration? Good. Good. Okay, people seem fairly sure of that. So I'm going to end that. Yeah, absolutely. Retinal tear, U tear, 
um, which is a tractional event with some bleeding around the retinal edge. So that's another acute sign. All the others are fairly chronic in nature. So fully percolated retinal hole. So you've avulsed the traction, six month history. You might want to think about treating it, but most people would leave it. But a tear you would treat. Good. Um, so two more questions. Which of the following is not a risk factor for regmatogenous detachment? I hope the panelists are also voting. Oh no, I didn't know we could. <laughs> Goodness. Probably you can. <laughs> I'm just watching, Jen. <laughs> it's all right, uh, Sam, I'll forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> Although you, you, you probably would have learned all about this if you'd listened to the talk. It's, so I there found we are. It very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So again, people are fairly sure. I'm glad to see. Good. Good. So I'm going to end that one there. Of course, hypermetropia is not a risk factor. Myopia is. Um, all the others are risk factors uh, for retinal detachment. And final question. Here we go. Which of the following facts about retinal skysis is true? Is there just one answer or can there be more than one? Uh, well, it can only be one, can't there? There's, yeah. We could uh, only answer on one, yeah. yeah. There's only one, yeah. This is the toughest one. Mm hmm. Gotta keep people on their toes? Absolutely. I didn't give the answer to this in the slides for all the points as well. So I was slightly mean. Ah, this is very, very split, this one. Very good. You should all go and read my Skysis article. Good, I'm gonna end that and then I'll go through it. So. The word retinoschisis means split retina rather than lid. So um, schisis is a split. It's like um, uh, schizophrenia, split personality. Um, degenerative retinoschisis is frequently found in both eyes. Over 80% of them are bilateral. Schisis can progress to detachment. That is the true one. It can do, although it's rare, but it can do. Retinous schisis classically produces a complete scotoma. So because you're splitting the layers of the retina, you're severing the connections between the photoreceptors and the nerve fiber layer. Therefore, no signals can travel from the retina down the nerve, and they cannot see anything over the schisis cavity. And retinous schisis always requires treatment? No, rarely. Only if it progresses to retinal detachment or you get a myopic fovea schisis. So there we go. Uh, that completes our poll. So I'll just run through. I had these questions on here. Thank you very much for your attention, everybody. Uh, those are our contact details at Clinical London, uh, where we are to be found. And I will also just hunt down my link. Let me stop screen share. Um, I will hunt down the link um, for my YouTube channel, and I'll put it in the chat. Any other questions in the meantime? I think we are getting very close to like one second off eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Jen, for a really informative and interactive webinar. You certainly made to me the, the inside of the eye seem an enormous world. And you're clearly very, very comfortable in there. And I remember that during the first lockdown, seeing a, a picture of you posted on Facebook where you were in full respirator and still doing retinal detachment, nothing stopped you. So you're, you're a great asset to all your patients and to Clinica London. 
and thank you very much for everybody who has attended tonight, for all your questions, your chat, doing the quiz, and for giving up you know, one of our lovely summer evenings and the football. And if we can't get the, have you got managed to get the yep, here we go. address there? Let's see, can you into the chat? Let's have a look. I don't seem to have the chat here. Can you read it aloud? Uh, it's a link. Oh, it's a it's a long uh, link. But if you put my name, Evgenia, and you can into YouTube, it should come up anyway. Terrific. Well, I'm I'm going to go and look at your YouTube channel, Jen. Thank you very much. Have a super evening, everyone. We will be having another masterclass relatively soon, and we'll let you know with pretty good notice about it. And we'll be getting Jen back again in the autumn, I think. Jen, do you accept? I absolutely do. I love Fantastic. teaching. I'm always happy to do it. Thank Lovely. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.